Welcome, everyone. On all construction projects, there are disputes of various kinds. Some are more common than others. Today, I'm going to talk about the five most common disputes and what you can do to help prevent them from happening. Uh, some types of disputes you have to live with because you can't stop them from happening. So what can you do to live with them and at the same time protect yourself? These disputes are not new. They were around long before I started coaching them. Will be around long after you are gone. Now, I'm an engineer and I'm not a lawyer, so do not take what I say in this webinar as legal advice. Do not use anything I propose without talking to your attorney or your lawyers. The topics we will talk about in this webinar come from CURT, C U R T, which is a construction users roundtable. On their website, CURT is the only voice to the construction industry. First primary goal is to enact broad, effective owner representation and increase owner leadership on construction industry issues. From the 2024 roundtable, these are the topics they found to be the most troubling in the North American construction industry. The topics are errors or omissions in the contract documents, failure to understand or comply with contractual obligations, poorly drafted or incomplete and unsubstantiated owner-directed changes, and an unrealistic contract duration or completion date. So in this webinar, we will address these issues and what you can do to, to minimize or, or mitigate them. Just to put this in perspective of what I mean by a contract administration team, here are typical organization charts and projects I have worked on. This is a small project organization. These projects were around several million dollars. I was the project manager and contract administrator. In this case, the projects were in four different locations. And I had a field engineer in each location. An example would be like a small truck scale, maybe a clarifier. This is medium sized projects, and they're around $100 million plus. Again, I was the project manager, construction administrator, with the construction manager and field staff. An example would be a small port plant, this one is 120 million. This is a large size project, around a billion dollars plus. I was a mechanical field engineer responsible for several hundred million dollar contracts. We had a separate person who was a contract administrator. Today, an example would be this is a fault mill, you might get a mine, you might get a pipeline. So, the first one we will look at is the errors or omissions in the contract document. From my perspective, this starts as a design office, and I will explain why. We will look at some basic project management to give you a better understanding of how projects are developed, which leads to how well the contracts are written and deal with problems. So the question is, how do you control a project? Well, you define the scope. The budget to plan the execution of the scope. You execute the scope for the plan, you control the scope, and you manage the budget variance. So, what is the single most important aspect of controlling a project? Well, it's just scope, 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 scope. So, as you are probably aware, if you have poor scope, no matter how well this your contract documents are, you'll have a lot of trouble in the field. So, with scope, you'll have fewer problems. If you still have problems, that's your less Morley, Lana here. Sorry, your microphone is sounding sort of muffled. It is. Yeah, it's a little hard to hear you. Is that better? I think so. Uh oh, I, um, hang on. How's that? Are you still there? That, that sounds a lot better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll continue where I, where I left off. Sure. That sounds better now? Yeah, it sounds a lot better. Okay. Um, so owners have different ways of developing scope, and it depends on the industry and the value of the work. All projects go through a project life cycle. Basically, as you go through the life cycle, 
you're developing scope in more detail and looking at the risk. Even if you want to paint a room in your house, you go through all the phases of a project life cycle. Some owners are loosey goosey, goosey with uh, scope development. They will combine life cycle phases and just wing it, and you sort out the problems in the field. Others believe in project management concepts, but to a point. If development costs start to get out of hand, they will just send it off to the field to sort out. Then they wonder why they are over budget and behind schedule. Then there are others who deeply are deeply committed to the project management process. This slide is the stage gate process of the project life cycle. This takes money and time to work your way through. However, when you get to the end of defined and go for final funding, your scope is well defined. Using this stage gate life cycle, when we said we needed funding of say $20 million, at the end of the project, we were always under budget. So when you look at your contracts you're preparing, what life cycle process is the owner using to come up with the scope? You should write your contract documents accordingly. Another issue is what's the driving criteria for the project? If it's a cost, that should be reflected in some of your contract clauses. The project needs to set criteria for decision making. It all comes down to this relationship. For a fixed scope, you have a fixed schedule, resources, and cost. The relationship is balanced. Now, if one of these changes, you have to look at the other three to see if they change. Throughout the project, you have to keep this relationship in balance. Your vendors and contractors have the same relationship. You have the same relationship if you want to paint a room in your house. Now keep in mind, the scope is the physical work of the project plus the work outlined in the clauses in your contract documents. Poorly written documents mean poor scope and problems in the field. As we go through the project life cycle, all projects have these different activities and procedures. So why do we do all this? What are we actually doing? Well, when you boil it down, your job as a project manager is to get rid of the uncertainty and mitigate the risk. Management do not like the uncertainty or risk. So in a management project, you should be looking at everything through the lens of getting rid of uncertainty and mitigating risk. If you look at your contract clauses, this is what they're trying to do. This flowchart shows the project tasks from start to finish that a project manager in a facility is responsible for. Now, this is from an actual facility job description. As a project manager for contract administration, you need to work with procurement to get what you need. You have to know a lot about procurement as there are too many things that can go off the rails, especially if procurement do not understand projects and their role in the importance of project success. The lawyers in procurement may know your project in general, but not the details. So do not depend on them to get everything right about what you need. Part of the project manager's job is to do a complete review of all project contract documents. So what should we look for in contract document review? We live in a cut and paste world. Contract clauses are cut and pasted from various contracts. There is spell check and auto correct that could change the meaning of what was written. It doesn't matter who's doing the changes. You should read every clause in the contract. Volume is what you should be looking for. Does the clause make sense uh, for your project? A contractor working in the desert is going to be different than one working in the Arctic. Are the clauses complete or is somebody cut off a part of a sentence? Do the clauses match what you were doing? Right? This is going to be independent. A contractor working in a sawmill is going to be a lot different than a contractor working in an oil refinery. Your clauses should match what your project is about. You should only say things once. If you say it more than once, you risk the chance of confusing things. If you have to make a change and don't change all the instances, you create problems in the field with what's correct, the possible claims. Your contract wording should be black and white. When people don't know what to do, they will put in ambiguous, bigot words or vague statements. This causes problems in the field as to what was meant. What did the contractor bid on? This clause has the word promptly in it. How well, promptly means different things to different people. Is it three days, six days? What is it? In fact, there's no scheduled delay for promptly. If you want the document back in three days and say so, before you sign the contract, discuss it with the contractor, 
and come to an agreement if there are differences. You want to quantify events so they can be scheduled and the field know what to look for and when. Another ambiguous phase is ASAP. Always quantify what you need. Do not use the supposed effects of climate change in your contracts. No one can predict the future. The wording, what I'm talking about here is the word weather. You may find a clause that talks about the weather and another clause talking about storms. Are they not the same thing? You look at your force majeure clause. Is it suitable for your project and location? Is it clear as to what is, is and or what is not covered? Look for any clauses that contradict other clauses. Remember, it's cut and paste and may have done that. Does the force majeure clause conflict with other clauses? There are a couple of open-ended clauses you may see. And these are examples of clauses that get rid of the uncertainty and mitigate risk by passing it on to the contractor. You can't predict the future. The contractor can't predict the future. So these are just guessing at something and throwing a lot of money at it then wishing and hoping nothing serious happens. It costs the owner a lot of money to do this. One is weather. The clause will state the contractor is familiar with the area and is responsible for all weather-related issues. Well, a couple of years ago, there was a weather event in Houston, Texas, that resulted in a 100-year flood. For the lower mainland BC, when the weather event uh, took out highways and bridges, a lake formed between Abbotsford and Chilliwack. At one point, by land, the only way out of the Vancouver area was through the US. Are these the types of weather events what you really mean by all weather-related issues? On a small project, this could bankrupt your contractor. If that happens, the owner will end up paying for the weather-related issue anyhow. Quantify what you mean by weather. Would it not be better to cover a 30-year or 50-year weather event as determined by Environment Canada? You need to look at ramifications of what you are proposing. Another one is heating and hoarding of concrete. If you want the contractor to include it, then the pressure is on you to make sure that you do not delay the contractor and force him into pouring concrete in the winter. Think of the problems with the owner changing something and causing all kinds of delays. It may be wiser and less frustrating to do this on time and material basis as needed. Now that's all I want to say about errors and omissions. It's important to review the contract documents and correct any errors or omissions before the contract is issued. The items noted above can cause all kinds of problems in the field. I want to take a look at failure to understand or comply with contractual obligations. Here we're talking about personnel on the ground managing a contract. It's a team effort. If the field engineer has a contract issue, they should work with the project manager or construction administrator to resolve it. Do not work alone. The field engineer position is important. It can be filled by two different uh, people, a being construction person or an office engineer. The construction person might generally know what has transpired to get to this point. They will have to come to up to speed on the issues. The office engineer who has worked on the project will have intimate detail on issues and know the design reason. This helps when looking at claims and changes. The show go without saying, the field engineer needs to read all the contract documents. If you find errors or omissions, and if the documents are not yet signed, try to have the changes made. If signed, get legal interpretation of any questionable clause. You may have to advise management there are potential problems with the contract. That being said, you should be familiar with the contracts you have to deal with and manage. On site, you will have contractor meetings. Well, you need to be prepared to answer any question that comes up about the contract. You should not be at a meeting saying, oh, you don't know the answer. When you administer the contract, you have to stay within the bounds of the contract documents, terms and conditions. That's why you need to know what the written contract says. The field engineer should be fairly familiar with the contract before work begins. It is advantageous that the field engineer is involved in the following events. The project team reviews of the bid package, the pre-bid meetings on site, the pre-award meetings. Okay? Stuff transpires at these meetings, so it is important that the field engineer attend these events. The contract administrator and the field engineers form the contract administration team. Following is the, terms, the team's responsibility and authority. 
The contract administration team are responsible for assuring the contractor's work is in conformance with the provisions of the contract. The contract administration team have no authority to allow deviations from the basic contract requirements. You'll need legal advice to do that. The contract administration team has no authority to instruct the contractor uh, on or how to do the work or methods of construction. The only time they can step in is if the work is unsafe. It's inspection, not direction. Keep in mind, once a contract is assigned, you are stuck with the contractor unless something drastic happens. Since you have to live with the contract and the contractor, you might as well make it an enjoyable experience. Your team needs the proper attitude. In order to work with a contractor, you need the right attitude. Some people can work quite well with a contractor. Anything is done with, without argument or screaming and shouting. There are others that do not know how to work with people and end up in disputes with a contractor or others on the job site. A lot of it has to do with the personalities of your field staff. At the end of the day, you would like to have a harmonious relationship with the contractor, so it is important to choose the right person for the field. Your field engineer is responsible to coordinate the contractor's construction efforts with all others on site. He has to ensure that the contractor conducts his operation so as to cooperate with others working in his vicinity and avoid interference with their work. You can only fit so many workers into an area, so the work has to be prioritized. Your field engineer has to be involved in the prioritization. Just as you expect the contractor to fill his obligations in the contract, you will also have to fill, fulfill your obligations of the contract. These uh, obligations to scope and uh, commitments are detailed in the signed contract. You should not expect the contractor to perform work that is outside of the written agreement without being paid or compensated for the work. Therefore, if the work to be performed is outside of the written agreement, a change notice has to be generated, which should include an agreed upon price and schedule. This document has to be approved and issued before the work starts. Since the contract is writing, all changes have to be in writing as well. The contract administrator, you do not want the contractor to fail. The aim is to have a successful project. If you follow the contractual agreement, carry out progress monitoring, check for quality and schedule adherence, you should end up with a successful project. As a field engineer, you're in, the business, you're in a business relationship with the other contractors and you need to treat it as such. You do not want to be ordering a contractor to do things. It's better to ask a request. You need, if you need something, done. Yelling or ordering will get you nowhere. You want to bring all parties together with the intent of getting the job well done. Now keep in mind, you're stuck with a contractor, so good relationships are required to get the quality job. Do not be too friendly. You are in, not in a personality contest or a partnership. As stated above, you're in a business-to-business -business relationship. You have to be careful, as in all projects, there will come a time when you have to beat up on a contractor or a vendor. To do this, you need clear conscience. Clear conscience. If you are too friendly with the contractor and vendor, this becomes very difficult for you to do. Yes, you want a harmonious relationship with the contractor, but it has to be a business-like relationship. You have to think ahead. You should be familiar with what is happening day to day. However, you should realize the decisions made today could affect something in the future. You should always be thinking ahead to try and anticipate problems. By anticipating problems, okay, you can save the contractor and the owner money. You want to be fair and reasonable. A contract is a meeting of the minds of the contracting parties at a particular point in time and under a particular set of circumstances. Both parties have an equal responsibility to carry out their respective obligations under their contract. As a contract administrator, you are an arbitrator and should not be making the contractor do more than what the contract calls for or to do extra work without fair compensation. Do not be rushed. Do, do, do not make quick decisions as decisions made in haste are going to be poor decisions. You should look at the problem for possible consequences. If a contractor comes to you with a problem and a solution, you can be sure that he has thought about it for a while. You should think about it as well before making the decisions. I mentioned before about thinking ahead about the implications and results in situations like this. 
Do not work in a vacuum. Talk to others on your team to see what the total ramifications will be. You want to think through the problems so they can, you can only make a decision once you can advise the contractor once. Be firm. Once you have made a decision, stick to it. Don't procrastinate. Make a decision. The contractor may not like the decision start screaming and yelling. However, you must stand your ground. The screaming and yelling that you change in your mind, it will always be screaming and yelling. Sometimes you might be wrong about in your decision, and if it is your mistake, you say so. If you're honest about it, people will still work with you. You cannot be blaming others when it is your fault. To the site contractors, the field the contract administration personnel are the face of your company. What you do, what you say, and how you act reflects on your company's image to the contractors, the owner, and the outside world. As a contract administrator, you have to make decisions every day to act or not act. These decisions may uh, can have an effect on the contractor, the owner, or others. Throughout the project, you will have access to important information or knowledge. Your position is one of trust. You have to ignore any pressures and temp temptations. How these are handled will depend on the integrity, good judgment, and character of the contract administrator and the field engineer. To put this in perspective, someone has come along and given you millions of, doll millions of dollars to manage for them. Someone has faith and trust in you that you can do that. Everything you do has to be above board. All actions have to be in the best interest of the client. These actions have to be free from any personal gain, prejudice, or influence. Part of the field engineer's responsibility is interfacing with the noted project groups. You need to work with them to get what you need for your contractor, provide produce information to management, review project status uh, with the groups, and use their expertise so that you are not working in a vacuum. Each field, the field engineers are not each man for himself, but have to coordinate with each other to get the project completed. The position is a team effort that spans across the different groups within the organization. On site, you may want to have several related discipline field engineers situated in a room together. The field engineer is a project representative to the assigned contractor. All official contacts with the contractor should go through the field engineer. This single point of contact avoids confusion and places responsibility for the contractor with the field engineer. The position covers a lot of activities with coordination being involved in most of them. There's not just coordinating between contractors and the construction group, but also it involves coordinating with head office support groups, such as procurement, engineering, accounting, as well as on-site testing and inspections. Owners typically like to do the project procurement and logistics. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the procurement group's primary goal is to keep the facility running, not doing projects. I work with procurement people who are excellent at their job. They understand the importance of their actions to project success. Then there are others who do not understand how their actions or lack thereof impact the field and potential claim. I have seen this in the owners, the vendors, and consulting firms. Now keep in mind, the contractor doesn't have the equipment or material. When stated in the contract documents, they can't do anything and you have a problem. If you don't keep on top of the procurement process, this can be a big source of claims. When we talk about the site thinking ahead, you should be keeping track of the equipment, material, documents, and information they are obligated to provide. In the design office, procurement should have a schedule that shows for every piece of equipment the on-site date and the date the approved data sheet has to be in procurement's hand. The schedule needs to be continually reviewed and progress monitored. In the case of changes, the field engineer needs to know who is doing the project procurement and how long it will take to purchase items. The field engineer to keep, needs to keep track of the procurement schedule and should be looking ahead for possible problems. Material or equipment has to be delivered at the right time. If it arrives too early, it could affect the contractor's cash flow plan or create storage and handling problems on the site. Some equipment comes in, uh, needs to be stored indoors, and other equipment may be heavy and needs special arrangement for offloading. And this piece of equipment came in 350, 355 crates, of which 120 had to be stored indoors, 
with the heaviest piece weighing 63 tons. Offloading has to be arranged, equipment organized. The equipment that arrives late could affect the contractor's schedule, causing a delay, or the total project resulting in a late startup. Okay? Either of these would lead to a claim. This is why the material purchases and delivery schedule should be tied to the construction schedule. This should allow for the material to be on site as when and needed. The procurement, do, procurement groups will do the expediting. However, if a piece of equipment is important, then expediting should take place by paying a visit to the fabricator or manufacturer. For distance locations, you can always hire an inspection company to make a very regular visit to the manufacturer. Remember, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. So you need to make sure the vendors are working and making progress on your equipment or material. Priorities change, and if you're not making your presence known, your stuff gets put aside, causing the delayed shipment and fuel problems. Another thing things the owners like to do is logistics. They typically have a prefer, their preferred trucking companies, and they will get a discount on anything they truck. The push by procurement is to use these preferred trucking companies. Now, depending on what you're shipping, it could be a nightmare for the site. This transformer was worth $400,000 when it was standing upright. And on a site like this, it's just scrap. The black hole in the wall was the transformer manufactured loading dock. Procurement, in order to save a couple of thousand dollars in shipping, used X Works, which meant risk and liability transfer to the owner when they picked up the transformer. So, this manufactured production schedule was full. The delivery of this transfer was, transformer was six months. Okay? The owner now had to beg the manufacturer to get back in the production line and go through all the grief of the insurance claim. Just this one action caused scheduling delay problems or scheduled delay claims on the site. At another company and another different project, the procurement group tried the same ex export shipping. This project was schedule driven and we could not afford to have the equipment damaged. So we pushed back and convinced management to let the manufacturer ship an FBA to the job site. Here we look at this relationship again. The field they have obligations to meet the resources. Miss something or are late, the contractor is going to go back and look at the other three and may, and may come back to the clean to get his project in balance. So when you look at the relationship, if the equipment is late, the schedule will change and maybe the cost will change as well. Any change made to bring the contractor's or vendor's relationship back into balance should be covered by a scientific paper from the contract administrator. Cost control and scheduling should not be making any changes without the piece of paper. To avoid the problems with understanding of the contractual agreements and obligations, your company should have procedures and training available for the contract administration team and procurement. The next issue is poorly drafted or incomplete or unsubstantiated claims. For the contract administrator, you shouldn't have you shouldn't even be looking at a claim if it's not complete. You can send it back to the contractor with a note telling them to if they want to consider it considered and clean it up. Now, each box in this slide represents a claim clause in a contract. Every contract has numerous claim clauses covering a wide range of possibilities and possible issues. The challenge for claims is to put the claim in the right box. If a contractor is sending you a claim, they better know what box it goes in. It's up to them, not you, to fit the claim into one of the boxes. If the claim is justified but doesn't fit into one of the boxes that you have available to you, then it's back to procurement and the lawyers to sort it out. You can't go changing the contract claim clause to get the claim to fit one of the boxes. It's either in or out. No matter how hard you try, you will have claims. So don't be surprised. As an example, if you're doing any excavation or driving piles, a common clause you will find, and you may be familiar with, is change condition. When you go up for bids, the above ground components can be known with certainty. It's the subsurface or latent condition that are unknown until you actually dig a hole. <clears throat> if you try to get the contractor to assume the risk for the underground conditions, they will add a high contingency. You want all the contractors to bid based on the actual scope, so a contract will have a standard clause called change condition. The challenge before bid is to determine how much underground information do you get. There will be a balance between better information on the substrate strata for design 
and the cost of acquiring the information. Using the contract change conditions clause, some contracts will have a statement that the contractor has to notify the contract administrator within five days if he believes he has encountered the change condition. This gives the contract administrator time to look into the situation. You will typically have weekly meetings with the contractor. At these meetings, you should constantly review the possible claims. Here are some questions to ask. If yes, then the contractor should start the claim process. This is the form we use to keep up to date on potential claims. This document is part of the program's payment invoice. This allows the field engineer to see what claims are out there and what is coming. It allows the contract administrator to get in front of any claim and investigate its justification. It also allows the field engineer to witness what work actually goes into the claim. Also, this also cuts off the contractor from showing up three months after the project has been closed out with his claim for the extra work. One way or another, you need a constant review of claims and potential claims. When it comes to claims, remember this relationship. What has to happen to get everything back in balance? So think of this relationship to following typical claims. You see change conditions or changes in work. We have added work or changes ordered by the owners or construction manager. Changes due to different site conditions. Reduction of work. In increased difficulty of performance. You have delays, disruption, interference. This includes owner supplied material and drawings. And again, this relationship applies to vendors as well. Another area for a claim is a plenary clause. If a piece of equipment is important to the schedule, We'll sometimes use a penalty clause for schedule slip to ensure you get the equipment uh, on schedule. Everyone wants to have a penalty clause, but you cannot have a penalty clause without a bonus clause. You have to have both. This is an example of a penalty clause we use. Now, every vendor is going to be different, but you need at the beginning to define what does ready to ship mean. It should be clear and everyone needs to understand it. On this project, ready to ship was after the equipment had been prepared for shipment, was crated, and ready to be put on a truck. The vendor put a green tag on the box with the date and sent us a picture of it. On this one, the vendor actually made $150,000 in this penalty bonus clause. When it comes to your projects, you have to treat every project as if you will end up in a lawsuit. Your project may be moving along smoothly when out of the blue along comes a lawsuit. May not be you that causes it, but here you are. This means you need to keep meticulous notes, have daily activity reports, minutes of meetings, etc. If in a lawsuit, your documentation, your notebooks and emails will be subpoenaed and looked at. Therefore, you have to be very careful about your right about what you write, as you do not want to hinder your chances of winning. When you think about it, this is why you have company procedures to follow. They will have come about because of previous lawsuits. So you want to follow your procedures. All communication between the contract administration team and the contractor has to be in writing. No verbal agreements, otherwise it is he said, she said. You should be aware that any email you send or receive is out there forever. Your project can go south on you at any time, so you have to be prepared. This applies to equipment failure. You may have to prove the equipment was installed correctly. Your project should have published approval in it. You should not be having a field engineer approving over anything over, say, $5,000 for long schedule delays. If you have schedule delays, the scheduler should have a signed piece of paper with the reason for the delay and the length of the delay. It should be signed by the contract administrator. You want this, as you will be required at the end of the project to explain why you're behind schedule. With a piece, piece of paper, it's here's the reason. Documentation is very important to the administration of your contracts. One never knows when a lawsuit or claim will come about. In these situations, the person with the most information wins. Therefore, you need to maintain complete, accurate, well-organized documentation based on fact. Keep opinions out of the documentation. If you do not have sufficient information, you'll have trouble with claims or lawsuits. You can have all the information. However, if it's filed in a poor system, you may not be able to find what you need. <clears throat> Project documentation can be paper electronic. 
Make sure you follow your company procedures when it comes to storing project documentation. You need to keep all the documentation on the company servers and not on your hard drive. The filing system should be organized in such a manner that you can find what you need. Make sure you're consistent in how you file information so it doesn't get lost. You may need it. When it comes to claims, the assumption is the other side will not be able to prove anything. As part of contract administration, there's a need to have complete, thorough, accurate, and timely documentation of all events from start to finish of a contract. This includes not only the written documentation, but electronic as well. The contract document should spell out what documentation you require from the contractors, and your internal procedures should outline what documentation you should be keeping track of. If you have not done so already, try to take a course in technical writing. You need to understand how to get your point across in as few words as possible, but at the same time, being clear and concise. Just like scope documentation, vague and ambiguous will be trouble. Before a contract is signed, you need to know what documentation you need to collect and what you need to have the contractor provide. As a contract administrator, you should see what information is needed to close out the project uh, and the contracts. This gives you the opportunity to put your requirements in the contract and to start collecting the information at the start rather than at the end. You could be, have a costly, time-consuming problem looking for the information at the end of the project when you could have been collecting it all along. Be especially aware of what accounting is looking for. If contractors know that you are keeping good documentation, you are less likely, likely to have frivolous claims. This leads to a better running job. All documentation should have the following information on it. The job number and or the contract number. The date in a recognizable format. There are different formats between Canada and the US. It should be, be signed so we know who wrote it. You can use electronic signatures if required. The revision numbers, if necessary, or if a contract, any corrections initialed and signed by the date, the signature. Need a distribution list. Spell out any abbreviations or acronyms used. If you've been working on projects for any length of time, the above should be second nature to you. Make sure that these points are shown on your documentation. With electronic correspondence, mostly the above is easy to handle. Without the above, there could be disputes about the viability of the document. Now, the above TLA statement is absolutely meaningless. I tell you, until I tell you that TLME, TLA means three letter acronyms. With documentation, you're trying to prove a fact. In some cases, this can be easier now as we can take digital photographs on a regular basis. It is important that your electronic files be well organized as so you can find information that you're looking for. When filing, it is important that the contract administrator put the file number on the document and stores electronically in the right location. If you leave it up to someone else, you may never find the information again. Following are some types of documentation you may see on the job site. As a contract administrator, you should have a standard daily report form for the engineers to use. You want to be collecting information every day to be able to refute any claims. Specific things to collect are weather, work done, hindrances or delays, instructions or conversations with the contractors, material received, equipment received, visitors, field work, field work orders issued, contract change orders issued, fire watch, evacuations, any safety issues, any delays or problems. What you're recording is factual information. You record all the facts. Don't depend on your memory or take shortcuts in your reporting. It's facts, not conclusions or opinions. If you have a claim, you may have to refer to what you wrote three months ago. Will you be able to understand what you wrote? Write it so it will be clear and understandable to you or others at a much later time. Do not generalize these specific. With any disputes, it's the daily reports that are going to save you, so make sure you put some effort into them. Since all communication with your contractors has to be in writing, correspondence is the most important element of the documentation you have. The correspondence, whether hard copy or electronic, has two purposes, right? Transmit information and provide documentation. 
With correspondence, you have to make sure you are not including something that may go against you in a claim or lawsuit. This is particularly troublesome with email. You should not be discussing contentious issues in your email. If you have contentious issues, it should be discussed face to face with an email summary. You should never forward email threads without editing, editing them. Most people don't read the thread and could be passing on derogatory comments or information that could make you lose the lawsuit. Emails are useful, useful for general conversations to sort of agreements, gather information, etc. When it comes to changes to contracts, you will need a hard copy signed document. <clears throat> Excuse me, email will not do. Different jurisdictions allow for hard copy documents to be scanned and the hard copy shredded. Check your company policy on this. Your email should be saved on a company server and they should be a, there should be a company policy on what emails to archive. With email, it is so easy to type out an email and hit send. Just because you have sent the email does not mean the ball is in the other person's court. You should look at what, what it's like yourself. You go through your emails to determine which ones you will answer today and maybe get around to others. If you send an email and you want a response, you should phone the recipient and tell them to look for your email and give you a response to it. Throughout the course of the contract, you will get correspondence from the contractor that you may not agree with. Correspondence from the contractor should be acted upon right away. If you do not respond to these types of correspondence, it implies agreement. It could be detrimental to you in a claim situation. Do not procrastinate about things you feel uncomfortable about. Okay? If you need time to gather information, send a note back telling them that you were gathering the information and that you take exception to what was written. You'll have to get back to them in a timely fashion. This is when you are glad you have a good set of project daily reports. Sometimes we will send an email where we want to make a statement that we want the recipient to agree to. Typically, we would say, please respond by May 15th if you agree with this arrangement. Okay. Well, if the recipient does not respond, that means he doesn't agree with the arrangement, and you are not stuck trying to get agreement. The way around that is to reword the phrase and say, please respond by May 15th if you do not agree with this arrangement. You make the arrangement in your favor, and now if he does not respond, he agrees with that. Of course, if you do this in email, you have to get a read receipt. For claims, it is important to have accurate, factual information, and lots of it. You want to stay on top of claims. The next issue uh, we want to talk about is the clause changes ordered by the owner or construction manager. This is another common one. And you will not get away from owner-directed changes. Events happen that may force the owner to make changes to the scope of the project. <clears throat> changes happen all the time. The owner alters or adds or even deducts work from the contract during the progress of construction. Any of these changes entitle the contractor to claim extra compensation on a lump sum job. Many projects have been abandoned due to market conditions changing. In operating facilities, there can be a schedule delays or access restrictions even cash flow issues. <clears throat> in this picture, the conveyor on the bottom left is version two. We had the layout all figured out and we're ready to order the conveyor when the owner told us we had to change the layout. At the beginning, I mentioned criteria for doing the project. The pr pr criteria for this project was technology. The business plan depended on a more efficient method of unloading rail cars. <clears throat> what happened is the owner made a safety change somewhere else in the facility. Well, that change had a ripple effect, causing our project criteria to change from technology to safety. The change brought in new stakeholders who could override what we were doing. We suggested a couple of options, but management said, no, we have to redo the layout, add more conveyors to get everything to work. That change cost the project like $500,000. Owners' changes can sometimes not be a big deal. Other times it can be a big deal and have to be looked at in great detail. A change could have a ripple effect on other parts of the project. A change to one contractor more often than not 
has impact upon other contractors. <clears throat> when the owner comes to you with a change of scope, you need to look at these ripple effects to see how they will affect your contractor's work. Some of these factors could affect the completion of your contractor's base contract. You can use these to push back on the owner. These ripple effects come from the National Change Order Procedures Guide. These are explained in detail in the guide. For owners changes scope, it's back to the relationship and what do you have to do to keep it in balance? How will the ripple of factors affect this relationship? These should help you understand the effects of the owner's change to the project. You can use this to push back on the owner, make them aware of the effects of what they are trying to do. Do they have other options? There may be no other option and you have to do it. Like owners, <clears throat> excuse me, like owners changes, you can't get away from unrealistic completion dates. Although the owner may be using the stage gate process for scope development, there are projects that will just bypass the process as there is need for action now. This picture is an example of this. Headquarters gave facility management three years to build a containment pond, improve the dikes around the spheres, and pave the area under the spheres. There's actually six years. You want to see the uh, three here in this picture. For two years and six months, management ignored them. Then it was, oh, we need to do this and have it all complete by the end of the year. Well, this was an environmental project, so there were regula regulations that had to be followed. First, we had to do the design work. Then it was work with the contractor, figure what the scope and the plan of work was going to be. This was winter work, and we weren't sure if we were going to be able to make the date or not. But we did make it. But it cost the owner a lot of money for us to get it done and save them from the wrath of headquarters. So you can't get away from these requests. So what can you do? Okay. Well, don't be rushed. What's the scope? Look at getting rid of the uncertainty, mitigating the risk. Take some time to figure out what they're asking for. Do not work in a vacuum. Okay. Bring in the expertise as needed. Can it be done? Can it be done? Again, it's as scope schedule budget resources. Can you get the resources, the equipment, the material, and manpower to do the work? Sometimes the owner's bureaucracy will affect the duration of your work. This has to be taken into account. Look at the risk involved. Okay? Can you do part of it now and finish it later? It might be risky, but it gets a part of it done. Resources are going to be a big problem. Look at your options, delivery dates for material, equipment. Okay? Push back on the owner with the above information in hand. If there are serious resource issues, the owner may go for part now and part later. What's it going to cost them? These requests spell nothing but trouble. One way to try and protect yourself is to have everything you are proposing written down, okay, what's included and what is not included. It has to be clear and concise because it's going to come back and uh, come back at you at a later date. So that's all I'll say about these five issues. Now, hopefully it gives you some ideas on how to address them on your projects. Again, these problems are not new, and you will be dealing with them throughout your project management career. Now, if you're interested in further project management training, these are some of my online workshops that are available through Process. And do you need a second pair of eyes to review your contract documents? Not from a legal point, but from getting rid of the uncertainty and the risk. If you don't have the time to review the contract documents, you can always get in touch with me. So thanks for attending, and we have some time for some questions and answers. Nobody seems to have any questions, Morley. Okay, if there's no questions, then we can end this. All right, thank you so much.